Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, today, hopefully, should be fairly nice and easy. We're just reviewing some of the material that we've already covered. Uh, obviously, I can't review everything that we've covered on 2D models in continuous time, but I thought I'd go through a few of the, the main things. Um, and especially, this is a good opportunity if you're not comfortable with certain things like you're not sure about finding equilibria or uh, looking at null clines or direction fields or sketching phase planes or uh, finding the Jacobian. Rathowitz criteria, all of these sorts of things. This is a good opportunity to ask me those questions. As I mentioned on Monday, uh, the, the last section of the course is going to be on modeling infectious diseases. We will be using many of these techniques going forwards, but often I will say, you know, I won't necessarily work through all of the, the stuff. I won't say, okay, here is how we derive the equilibrium, here is well find stability, and so on. Some of the time I'll just sort of say, this is what the answer is. Um, so the reason for that is that I can cover some more interesting conceptual things rather than going through the same methods over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, this is a good opportunity if you want to firm up any of those things before we move on, okay? Okay, so the first section of the course looked at simple or one-dimensional population models. This is where you have a homogeneous population. There's no variation in it, or at least you don't care about the variation in it. Um, very simple population growth models. Um, they could also be applied to other things, not just population growth, but we've mainly focused on population growth. We then moved on to um, looking at species interactions. And we focused on species interactions like uh, competition between species for different resources, um, also consumer resource models. So if you've got something like a predator and a prey, a host and a parasite, a plant and their herbivores, there's some kind of victim and an exploiter interaction. So there's this asymmetric interaction. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking at those, mainly focusing on predator-prey models. Uh, infectious disease models are essentially consumer resource models as well, but they um, have a few special properties. So we'll, we'll kind of look at them a bit separately. But pretty much everything that we've done in terms of looking at models for species interactions, uh, the same ideas apply if we have um, a single population, a single species say, but there's variation within that population. So there could be variation by things like age or by sex. Um, it could be uh, things like different genotypes or phenotypes. Um, if we're thinking about evolution, um, they could uh, be a variety of different types of, of characteristics that we have in a population that maybe affect uh, different things like their growth rate. So we can use the same ideas about finding equilibria, stability, and so on to understand um, models of a single population without um, with, with some of this this heterogeneity, so they're no longer homogeneous. There's some variation. Okay, so just to quickly review model construction. So in continuous time, and we're going to be focusing on continuous time. We can write a general two dimensional model of species interactions, or or a single population has variation within it as GHCT is equal to some f of xy, which is the growth rate of species or class x, and dy dt <laughs> has a different growth rate again, but also depends on x and y. And we can write that in continuous time, or we can write something similar in discrete time. In this discrete time model, we could also write as xt plus 1 is equal to f tilde xt by t, and likewise for yt plus 1. There's a couple of different ways in which we could write that. This first way that I've got here, basically saying what's our current population in this time step, and then this is telling us the change in population size. Whereas here, we're just saying current population size, and then we have an updating function that updates the entire population. Okay. So like I said, we focused on species interactions, but there are lots of cases where we care about variation. Um, we're going to be talking about infectious disease models. One of the things in infectious disease models, if there's variation in risk, we saw in COVID-19, for example, that older people were more at risk of dying from COVID-19 than younger people. And so you might want to think about the, the variation within your population when you model them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to work through a worked example um, where there is a stage structure. Um, by stage structure, I mean that different... Um, uh, an organism that goes through different life stages. So for example, butterflies start off as caterpillars and they pupate and then they become butterflies. So we can think of those as two distinct stages. Um, you could come up with continuous time, uh, sorry, continuous age models of um, 
of a species where it say uh, grows up from you can have all the different ages that requires pdes we're not going to go into that so we're just going to think about these stage structured models okay so suppose we've got a population of caterpillars i've put them around the wrong way here i realize caterpillars are going to be rc and butterflies are going to be capital b And we're going to say that butterflies produce caterpillars according to a logistic growth rate. We should all be familiar with our logistic growth rate. Crucially, butterflies produce caterpillars. Remember that. We have standard carrying capacity K, and intrinsic growth rate R. Met that, that functional form a lot. Note that caterpillars do not reproduce. It's only butterflies that produce caterpillars, and butterflies don't produce butterflies. And the logistic growth rate we're going to assume only depends on the density of butterflies. So the density of caterpillars is not going to affect um, the growth rate at all. And then, or at least the, the reproduction rate, I should say. And then finally, we have caterpillars pupating into butterflies at a per capita rate P. And they're going to, uh, the butterflies are going to die with a per capita death rate D. Okay, we're going to assume that there are no there's no caterpillar mortality rate in this, okay? All caterpillars that are born will eventually pupate. It's a simplification, but it makes the model a little bit easier to analyze. Okay, so what I want you guys to do, first of all, is write down a set of continuous time equations for this population with time given by capital T, because we're going to rescale time eventually. Uh, and you might find it helpful to sketch a flow diagram. So we've met flow diagrams before, where you have, say, uh, for example, Let's see if we had like a host population and a parasitoid population. There'd be some processes here. And these arrows tell us the, the rates at which things are happening. Okay. So have a go at maybe sketching that little flow diagram or transfer diagram first to help you understand what this model looks like. And then have a go at writing down the equations for that. Okay. Any questions, just let me know. We're just going through model construction at the moment. So if you have time before I go through it, we're just trying to turn this into a set of ODEs, okay? Whenever you're doing this, it's um, it's good to try and just break down, you know, often if you've got like a long block of text giving you all your different things, try and break it down into different, you know, what does this sentence say? And then do that component. What does this sentence say? Do that component. Think of it as like a checklist that you're working your way through. I have a show of hands who's been able to write down some equations. It's okay if you have. Okay. Okay. Let's see what does this look like? Well, if we start off with a schematic, some people find this easier, some people not. It's good to be able to, to draw them. The thing of these is being if it helps, you can think of these as being like different buckets. And then the arrows are kind of, uh, these buckets are filled with a certain amount of water, say, and the arrows between them are like pipes. And you're thinking about the flow from one of these buckets to another. So these arrows would be pipes that have pumps in them, say. So what are we told? We've got a caterpillar class and a butterfly class. We're told, first of all, that butterflies produce cap caterpillars according to a logistic growth rate. So butterflies produce caterpillars. So there's some production here. And this occurs at a rate R times by one minus B over K. This is a little bit tricky because this should maybe should be split out of the dash line. I've got it as a solid line in my notes, but reason being is that butterflies don't become caterpillars, but they are producing caterpillars. So we're indicating that there's a certain amount of production going this way. And then what else are we told? We're told that we have pupation. So caterpillars become butterflies at rate P and butterflies die at rate D. So here we've got that top arrow is reproduction. Here we've got pupation. And the D is deaths. And then if we want to write that down as a set of equations in continuous time, DCDT, well, 
it's being produced. So what are the arrows flowing in? We're going to have R, B, because each butterfly is, is contributing to reproduction, times by one minus P over K. And then we think about the arrows leaving C. So here we have pupation, occurring at a per capita rate P. So we have P times by C. And then for our butterflies, arrows in, we've got pupation. So P times by C. Arrows going out, we have deaths of butterflies minus DP. Can I have a show of hands? We've got equations that look like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've been through non dimensionalization a few times. I really want to make sure that this is clear exactly what we're doing and going through it as well, a little bit more from first principles. Usually, what I've been doing is saying, okay, if we let x equal something, y equal something, then show that we can reduce a model to this. Okay, but how do we know what those those substitutions should actually be? Okay, so let's break this down into first like rescaling time. So the whole principle of all of these like rescaling is is there's a there's a mathematical component as well as a conceptual component, right? Mathematically, what we're doing is we're saying okay, these two systems are equivalent. All we're doing is we're just stretching the time length. Okay, and there are certain ways in which you can scale time to eliminate parameters from your system. And then because those models are equivalent, that, that parameter essentially doesn't affect the outcome or the qualitative outcome. So things like your stability. So an example might be, I'm gonna talk about infectious diseases just because we're gonna be moving on to them. You might have uh, your original model is set up in terms of days as your unit of time, um, but you might want to rescale it by the average infectious period. So how long are um, host infected by uh, a pathogen for on average, or you might want to say scale by, um, you know, if you've just got a normal population growing, you might want to scale by the average lifespan of that host. So now time is no longer say in days, but it would be in, in generations. Okay, so there are certain cases where rescaling by time also has a, a sort of conceptual advantage as well as having this mathematical advantage as reducing the, the number of parameters. Okay, so here we had a capital T as our a uh, time variable, we're going to use some parameter m to rescale this. Okay, so we're going to define a new time variable is equal to m times by t. We don't know what this m is yet. It could be, for example, things like death rates, birth rates, growth rates, interaction rates. In this particular example, we're going to rescale time by our pupation rate. Okay, so in other words, we're going to let, in our case, t equal p times by capital T. Then if we take the derivative of this, we'll have d big T by d little t is equal to one over p. Have a go at rescaling. I'll put the equations up here in case you didn't get them. And I'll just write down what I wrote down below. Rescale this model so that we're now instead of d c and d b by d big T, they're by D level T instead. Okay. Do you want to make this substitution? If you can't quite recall, if for example we take DC D little T, to get that we have to multiply DC D, D big T and D big T D little T. Essentially, we're kind of cancelling those big T's out. Okay. So we know what the dc d big t is because it's written above. We've defined this relationship between little t and big t. So we can write down what the derivative is here, multiply these two things together, and that will allow you to rescale the model. Okay. Okay. So what do we have? Well, for our caterpillars, dc b d big t. Rather, dc d little t is going to be dc d big t times by d big t d little t. So dc d big t was just written above. So we had rb times by 1 minus b over k minus p times by c. And we're multiplying that by 1 over p. So we get rb 
over p times by one minus p over k minus c. And then for butterflies, we're going to have p times by c minus db. So what we had before for db d big t, sorry, this should be db d little t there. And we're multiplying this by d big t, d little t, which is one over p. When we do that, we just end up with c minus d b over p. So we've left everything here in terms of, of the parameters that we had to start with. But whenever we get parameters together that always appear together, like in this case, we have r and p together. So we could come up with a new parameter and replace this r over p with a new parameter here. Likewise, we could replace this d over p with another parameter here. These are just numbers at the end of the day, so we can just replace them with another number. But it's the, given by these ratios. That would mean I would have one parameter here, one parameter here. And I still have this k as well. So I've got three parameters now, whereas before I had four parameters. So I've eliminated one of the parameters in my system, but it's still the same thing. All I've done is I've essentially just stretched the system, but I haven't changed anything fundamental about it. Okay. I've stretched its time limits. I have a quick show of hands who managed to get this. Yeah. Okay, so that's one way in which we could do non-dimensionalization. The other way in which we can do this, or, or you know, complementary way, is to rescale our population densities. So we've we've stretched the time dimension. Now we're going to think about stretching the our state variables. So these are the things like our our dx dt a state variable would be x. Okay, and usually when we've done this. Like I said, we, I've given you something like, uh, you know, x is equal to n over k, right? I've given you what this is. Here, we're going to try working through it with just some dummy variables, which are called alpha and beta. So we're going to define x to be alpha times by c, and y to be equal to b times, sorry, beta times by b. And when I say that these are dummy parameters, these are dummy parameters because I don't know what the substitution I want, but I'll work it out at the end. Okay, so I'll come up with values of alpha and beta that mean I can eliminate parameters. Okay, but to start with, we can just do everything in terms of these undefined alphas and betas. Okay, so again, have a go at rescaling the population densities now. So we've got these equations above. I'll just highlight them here. So we want to do this is our dc dt, and this is our db dt. And I want you to let x equal alpha times by c, y equal beta times by b, the difference between the beta and the b there, and non-dimensionalize this model, okay? So do the same thing as we would have done previously. We can work out what is dx dc, what is dy db, and then, for example, dc dt multiplied by dx dc is going to give me dx dt. Okay, so have a go at using these dummy substitutions here. Non-dimensionalize this model. You'll end up something that has alphas and betas and r's and p's and so on but then you'll be able to select any value of alpha, say that you want an any value of beta that you want to eliminate some of these parameters and make it simpler. Okay, so you should be able to reduce it down to just two new parameters that you define. Have a go at that. In fact, I'll say, choose your alpha and beta in such a way that you have no parameters in your dx dt equation. That will give you two parameters in your dy dt equation. Obviously, there are different ways in which we can non-dimensionalize and scale these things, okay? So, okay. Who wants, I just have a show of hands, who would like to have a few more minutes or, and who would like me to go through it now? I have a show of hands who wants me to go through it now. 
Okay, so it's at least half of you, so I'll go through it now in that case. Okay, this one definitely is a little bit more complicated, but I, I just wanted to demonstrate where these substitutions come from, that they're not kind of just completely plucked out of thin air. You can use these dummy variables to do it and then define them at the end. Okay, so it starts looking worse before it ends up looking better. Okay, so let's start with our dx dt. So dx dt is going to be dc dt times by dx dc. which is going to be our dc dt was rb over p times by 1 minus b over k minus c. And then dx dc up here we defined, or is it here? x is equal to a alpha times by c. So dx dc is just going to equal alpha. So x was equal to alpha c dx dc is going to equal alpha. So we're just going to multiply this bracket by alpha. So if we expand out, we'll have alpha rb over p times by 1 minus b over k minus alpha c. And then now if I do my substitutions, well, alpha c we define to be x. So we're going to have a minus x on the end here. And b above we define b is equal to well, y is equal to beta times by b so b is going to be equal to y over beta so everywhere we see a b we can replace with y over beta so we have alpha r y over beta times by p in the brackets we'll have one minus y over beta k and then we have this minus x on the outside so what can I do now? Well, I said I wanted you to try and get this into the, into the form where we had no parameters in this first equation. So what I want to do is I want to eliminate these two things here and set these both equal to one, okay? So if I want to set this one here, alpha r over b to p equal to one, that implies that alpha needs to be equal to b to p over r. And this one here, I want one over beta k to be equal to one. So that implies that beta must be equal to one over k. If I do that, then I end up with just y times by one minus y minus x. So I've eliminated all the parameters in this first equation with these choices of alpha and beta. Okay, now we need to do the second equation. So we've got dy dt is db dt times by dy db. So we're going to have c minus db over p times by dy db, which is just beta. So if we multiply this out, I'd have a beta times by C. I'm going to at the same time replace C with X over A. And this is just rearranging my initial definition, X over alpha, I should say, not alpha A. X over alpha is equal to C. So we're going to have B times by X over alpha. Sorry, beta. <laughs> beta times by x over alpha, not b. I shouldn't have used beta and b in the same example. Too easy to get them mixed up. Okay, we had a minus db over p times by beta. So beta times by b is just y. So we're going to have a minus dy over p. Again, what I want to do here is I want to eliminate or reduce these parameters down. Because this beta and alpha are appear together, I can define a new parameter here. Let's call it A equal to beta over alpha. Let's define a new parameter B equal to D over P. We end up with A times by X minus B times by Y. So our fully non-dimensionalized system here 
with dx dt is equal to y times by one minus y minus x and dy dt is equal to ax minus by. That was a little bit tricky. If you want more practice of doing this dummy variable stuff, you can go back to some of the previous examples where we've non-dimensionalized them, use the dummy variables and see if you can get to the end product that we already know we have, okay? Okay, one other thing you should note about here is that in our original equations, we'll just, just go back up here, all the way back up to the top, we had a minus PC and a PC. So these two terms balanced, right? There was a minus PC and a plus PC. Now we've got a minus X and an AX. So it looks like these things no longer balance. But what we've done is we've stretched our X and Y dimensions by different amounts. So previously one caterpillar produced one butterfly. We still have that, it's just that this X and Y, they no longer correspond to the same amount of, of scaling to number of caterpillars and number of butterflies, okay? So that's why we need this constant here, A, which rescales our scaled number of caterpillars into a scaled number of butterflies, but they're scaled by different amounts. Again, we think about them stretching or shrinking things in different dimensions, okay? I can pull something in this horizontal dimension, and I could pull it by a different amount or squish it by a different amount in the other dimension, okay? So I can do those two things independently. And I do that because I'm setting X is equal to alpha times by C. So I'm scaling it by alpha and Y I'm scaling by beta. So I'm scaling those two things by different, different amounts. Okay, so we now have a fully non-dimensionalized model. So we can find our equilibria and stability. What I'll do is I will leave, I'll leave this one as an exercise here. It's good for you guys to have some more practice, I think, to make sure that you're fully comfortable with finding these equilibria. So show that there are only two equilibria with this model. I'll leave that for you guys to do afterwards. Remember, all we're doing is we're setting dx dt and dy dt both equal to zero at the same time. And finding values of x star y star that satisfy those okay well, i'm going to tell you that those are the two equilibria when is the non-trivial equilibrium biologically realistic so first of all what do i mean by when i say when is an equilibrium biologically realistic yeah so in the context of, of this particular model, we're talking about population sizes. They're scaled population sizes, but they're still population sizes, right? So we can't have negative population sizes. As a more general point, there's no reason why these have to be population sizes. In pretty much every example we meet, we're thinking about population sizes, even if that was say number of cells in a body or number of virus particles or anything, they're still population sizes. But these could, we could have a model of, say, uh, positions in space. So X, Y could be some coordinates with reference to a particular reference point, okay? So zero, zero might be where I'm stood here, and we're modeling how an organism moves around in the environment. At that point, your X and Y could take positive values if they're, say, over here with reference to me, but negative values if they're over here, okay? So whilst this has been basically what we've been assuming all along, Biologically realistic in terms of population sizes means non-negative. When we're talking about other things like spatial positions, they could be negative in principle, okay? So in this case, we've already got a trivial equilibrium. So for the non-trivial equilibrium to be biologically realistic, we need X star Y star to be positive, which in this case, we need A minus B to be positive or A to be greater than B. Okay, so we found our equilibria. We now need to do linear stability analysis. So remember what we're doing when we're doing linear stability analysis, whether we're in 1D or 2D, is we're saying, okay, we've got an equilibrium. We know our equilibrium, our, in this case, population size is not varying. We want to know what happens if you move a little bit away from that. So this is a nonlinear system, and nonlinear systems are kind of hard to deal with. 
So we're saying, okay, if you zoom in enough on a nonlinear system, anything that's say curved, you zoom in enough, it starts looking linear. Okay, just like the surface of the earth is curved, but locally everything looks flat. Okay. So we're going to approximate our nonlinear system by a linear system. And we're going to see whether that small perturbation grows or decays. And remember, if we did when we did our say exponential growth in 1D, that's a linear system. It either grows or it decays. Okay. It's a little bit more complicated when we're in 2D with linear systems because they can also do things like spiral in and spiral out. It's the same principle though. We have a small perturbation in now two dimensions, and we want to see whether that grows or decays and how it grows or decays. Okay. So we do that by using the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix linearizes our system. And we then evaluate our Jacobian at our different uh, equilibria and determine the sign of the real part of our eigenvalues. The reason we care about the sign of the real part of our eigenvalues is if you work out the general solution to these things, you end up with things of the form a to the minus real part of our eigenvalues times by t. Often I would just write this as e to the minus. Sorry, there shouldn't be a minus there. I'm thinking of stability too much. We end up with an e to the real part of our eigenvalues times by time. If our eigenvalues are real, this is just lambda i anyway, but they could be complex. For this to decay, the real part has to be negative. Okay. So this table here is just summarizing all of the different possible outcomes. We have six possible outcomes here. There are also what things that happen on the boundaries, but we're not going to focus on the boundaries between these regions because those are essentially um, uh, the knife edge scenarios. In fact, this center at the bottom is also a knife edge scenario but it does crop up in a few biological models, which is why we talk about it. But in most cases, we don't think about those knife edge scenarios that much. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We want to find the eigenvalues. To find the eigenvalues, we can solve our characteristic equations. So we can solve our determinant of Jacobian minus lambda times by the identity matrix is equal to zero. This will give you some, if we're in 2D quadratic in terms of lambda, you could use the quadratic formula then to find your lambda. That is one way in which you can do it. Often this is kind of a bit laborious or tricky, or you end up with some horrible expressions for your eigenvalues. Okay. But we don't necessarily need to do that. Okay. We don't necessarily need to solve our characteristic equation. If our Jacobian is in triangular or diagonal form, so if it looks something like this, A, B, C, D, if it's actually B is equal to zero or C is equal to zero, then our eigenvalues are just going to be the elements on the main diagonal. So we could just read them off straight away. So that's nice and simple. Don't confuse this with a case that looks like this. This is a common mistake. People then read off eigenvalues as B and C in this case, for example, or A and zero. The zeros have to be in where the B and the C are. Okay, so this one does not work. So in that case, it's nice to say we can read them off. If not, we could find the eigenvalues using the, the characteristic equation, or we can use the Ralph Hurwitz conditions to determine stability and the discriminant as well to determine if our eigenvalues are real or complex. So the Ralph Hurwitz conditions basically state that the real parts of our eigenvalues are guaranteed to be negative if and only if our trace is negative and our determinant is positive. So as long as we satisfy both of these conditions, we're guaranteed to have a stable equilibrium. It doesn't tell us whether it's a stable node. It doesn't tell us whether it's a stable spiral. If it's unstable, it doesn't tell us whether it's a saddle. It doesn't tell us whether it's uh, an unstable node or an unstable spiral. All we're, we're determining here is do we move towards it or do we move away from it? Okay, so it's, uh, it doesn't give you all the information that you would get from an eigenvalue, but we can work out that final bit as to whether we have, say, a, a stable node or a stable spiral by looking at the discriminant. So the sine of this trace squared minus four times the determinant. And if this is positive, then we have real eigenvalues. And if it's negative, then we have complex numbers.
Can anyone tell me what we need to get some sort of oscillatory behavior in our model? What do our eigenvalues need to be? Um, complex, okay. So we only see things like spirals and centers when we have complex eigenvalues. The reason in that case is that when we write out our general solution for our perturbation, we end up with trigonometric terms in there because we have our, um, we have these complex eigenvalues. We end up with e to the minus, uh, e to the complex number times by t. We can then write that out in terms of uh, an exponential multiplied by some trigonometric terms. That's where we get our oscillations. But we still care about the real part of that eigenvalue to tell us whether those oscillations grow or decay. So you can think about the amplitude growing or shrinking or staying the same. And if our eigenvalue is real, then we don't have any oscillations. That perturbation either grows or decays. Okay, let's see. We've got four minutes left. Is that enough time? It's going to be a little bit tight. What I'd say is you can start working through this. Obviously, all the, the solutions will be up in the field notes. Have a go at working through the stability analysis if you want now. If not, you can also leave now. It's, um, it's up to you. Maybe work through this in your own time. The self-study problem is sketching a phase plane. One thing I would emphasize here is this note that null clines are not necessarily straight lines. The examples that we've been doing by their nature are relatively simple. They might not feel that way, but they are relatively simple in the sense that we have always so far ended up with null clines that are straight lines, but there's no reason as to why they need to be straight lines. Okay, there's nothing, uh, nothing intrinsic about a null cline needing to be a straight line. It can be a curve. Okay, so bear that in mind. That's a heavy hint. Um, yeah, you are either free to go or you can work through this now and ask me any questions you might have. So find the stability. And then the self study problem is sketching a phase plane. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Other things about the group projects are now available online. If you have any difficulties accessing, accessing them, please let me know. There's a, there's a, a link. So you should have received an email or a on crowd mark. We should have. I'm not saying that it was distributed. There's a PDF there that uh, contains the problem we need to solve. Okay, so everyone is solving the same problem. The link is there. I've also included the link to that on the course schedule page as well. Okay. Any other questions, group projects or otherwise? Okay.